Mr. President, I rise uh, to offer a unanimous consent uh, request for the approval of two important nominees to ambassadorial positions that have passed through the Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, and the first that I want to offer deals with seeking to advance the nomination of William H. Duncan for the United States Ambassador to El Salvador. I appreciate my colleagues, two colleagues from the Republican side are here on the floor to respond to these requests. Um, Mr. Duncan is a 30-year veteran of the career foreign service. Uh, he has experience serving throughout the Western Hemisphere region, El Salvador, Monterey, Mexico, Mexico City, Asuncion, Madrid, Bogota, Matamoros. He has also served domestically in the Office of Andean Affairs, Mexican Affairs, Central American Affairs. He's had a tour in Baghdad and in the State Department Operations Center. I say this not to bore everybody with a long recitation. Mr. Duncan's had a pretty incredible career, and it's near impossible to imagine a career more fit to purpose a nominee better suited to serve an enormous and a unique challenge that the United States faces today in El Salvador. The U.S. faces a very tough question in El Salvador right now, and that is the current president of El Salvador, President Bukele. He is locally very, very popular, but he's utilized his popularity for malfeasance. He has exploited weak local institutions to begin to undermine civilian society and build up a security state. He's imprisoned around 50,000 of his own citizens since just March of this year and curtailed civil rights of the remainder. Members of Bukele's party have openly meddled directly in U.S. legislative elections. Experts increasingly doubt the country's ability to pay nearly $800 million in euro bond payments that it owes coming up in February. A default could spur a fresh round of migration northward from El Salvador to Mexico and the United States. My friends across the aisle frequently, and I think appropriately, cite migration as a top foreign policy challenge, and they've got a point. The size and scope of this crisis compounded by El Salvador and President Bukele's actions and the humanitarian impact on the entire region and our country is worsening by the day. I agree the issue needs much, much more attention. And El Salvador is right on the front line of this crisis. I lived in Honduras, very near the Salvadoran border in 1980 and 81. It was a challenge then, it's a challenge now. No country can, on its own, confront the myriad of challenges facing El Salvador today, transnational organized crime being one of them. So we've got to work together to strengthen the rule of law in El Salvador. That's essential if we're going to discourage irregular migration. Without the rule of law, El Salvador will never have the economic growth that it needs, nor will it be able to prevent human rights abuses and attacks on civil liberties, reduce gender-based violence, or defeat the threat from criminal gangs, all drivers of irregular migration. Addressing these drivers and other serious U.S. policy concerns requires engagement at the highest level by experienced and credible interlocutors such as Mr. Duncan. We urgently need a Senate-confirmed ambassador to engage President Bukele and El Salvador in civil society, including uh, courageous human rights activists on these issues. As Mr. Duncan noticed in his testimony in front of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, the relationship between the U.S. and El Salvador has been exceptionally close for more than 40 years, despite many, many challenging issues. Through a horrific civil war, a fraught peace process, and into today's challenges, such as fighting transnational organized crime, the U.S. has worked cooperatively with El Salvador in everything we can and disagreed firmly and constructively when we needed to. And it's worth noting that over these years, many Salvadorans have become our fellow citizens, including right here in the DMV through processes such as TPS status. Two and a half million Salvadorans live in the United States. They proudly contribute to our national fabric through their creativity and work ethic and to El Salvador through billions of dollars in remittances every year. Now, I've been speaking a bit. One word you haven't heard me mention at all is Cuba. I have a feeling, based on an earlier iteration of this, that my colleague will cite concerns about the administration's uh, 
challenges with Cuba as a, as a reason for this hold. And I just asked the question, what does this have to do with El Salvador? There's always a differences of opinions within the Senate on every administration's policies on Latin America, and especially Cuba. I get that. Even at times strong opposition, and I've raised opposition about issues with respect to Cuba with this administration and others. And we all are free to offer bills and amendments dealing with the many challenges in Cuba. But Mr. Duncan was nominated for this role in an entirely different country, El Salvador, in February 2022. His Senate Foreign Relations Committee hearing was in August. He's been pending consideration by the full Senate since then as the human rights situation in El Salvador has been working. Let's get our uh, am worsening. Let's get our ambassador out onto the field and put him to work. And so with that, Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent that the Senate consider the following nomination, calendar number 1106, William H. Duncan, a career member of the Senior Foreign Service class of Minister Counselor to be Ambassador of the United States of America to the Republic of El Salvador, that the Senate vote on the nomination without intervening action or debate, that if confirmed, the motion to reconsider be considered made and laid upon the table, and the President be immediately informed of the Senate's action. Is there objection? Mr. President. Senator Florida. Mr. President, reserving the right to object, I first want to thank my colleague from Virginia for coming down the floor to bring up the issue of U.S. Uh, foreign policy toward the Western uh, Hemisphere. I agree with my colleague that um, U.S. foreign policy towards Latin America is of the utmost importance uh, and that the ambassadors we send to Latin America must advocate uh, for the right policies. Sadly, as both Vice President and President Joe Biden has had a policy of appeasement toward Latin American dictators. President Biden has given operational control of the U.S. southern border to criminal cartels that work with narco states like Venezuela and has shown there's no consequences for crossing the U.S. border Ill illegally. He removed FARC from the list of foreign terrorist organizations, which I cannot understand why he would do that. He didn't invite Juan Guaido to the Summit of the Americas, even though the United States recognizes him as the legitimate interim president of Venezuela. He eased sanctions on the illegitimate regimes in Cuba and Venezuela, while getting nothing in return uh, to stop the oppression of the innocent people in these countries. Biden's policy of appeasement towards Latin American dictators has done nothing to help the Cuban and Venezuelan people. And I, I believe what his actions have made our hemisphere more dangerous and more dangerous for the people who live in these countries. While President Biden didn't stand up to Castro, Diaz Canal, and Maduro, we are left with a destabilized hemisphere that is less peaceful and puts our national security at greater risk and hurts the citizens of these countries. These are murderous, illegitimate dictators. Appeasement is the worst move imaginable. Iran, Russia, and Communist China love it when Biden is nice to their friends in Latin America. And as any active observer of Latin America knows, the countries in the region are incredibly interconnected. Policy towards Cuba affects policy towards every, everywhere else in the region. And as we see left-wing socialist candidates rising in the region, like Gustavo Petro in Colombia, it only gives further reasoning for why the United States must strongly project our values of stability, democracy, and anti-communism. Joe Biden has the power to join the Cuban people to call for the Cuban Party, Communist Party, to change. Where is he? Aside from a couple of statements he made last year, President Biden has not taken one action to support the Cuban people and their fight for freedom. He's done nothing to provide them with internet connections. He talked about it, didn't do it. He's done nothing to support democracy movement on the island. Talks about it, hasn't done it. Instead, he and his administration have bowed to the demands of Cuba's murderous regime, have chosen not to stand for democracy and human rights. The president couldn't even be bothered to speak about the one-year anniversary of the July 11th historic and peaceful demonstrations in Cuba. It's time for President Biden to stand up. He's got a call for the immediate release of the hundreds, hundreds of pro-democracy activists, including children as young as 14 years old, that the regime is unjustly detaining and subjecting to physical and psych psychological torture. President Biden's policies towards Latin America have diminished our influence in the region, and the people have seen their calls for freedom abandoned. It's essential to the national security of the United States, as well as our efforts to support freedom, democracy, and human rights, that President Biden reverses these foolish actions and not allow totalitarian dictatorships in our hemisphere to go unchecked. We can never bow to dictators, never. It's time for Biden to lead and oppose these genocidal dictators and support human rights. Until he does, I'm not gonna allow these nominations to go forward. And I, I don't disagree with anything probably my, my uh, colleague from Virginia said as far as is, is we have got, you know, we've, there's different ways you can do 
foreign policy in Latin America, but not to be willing to just make a statement that these poor people in Cuba ought to be released is just unbelievable to me. So therefore, Mr. President, I object. Um, Objection, sir. Mr. Mr. President, let, let me respond, and I, I have a, I will soften my request toward my colleague after I briefly respond. My response is this: I, I don't see the logic. Cuba is not El Salvador. I, I listened to my colleague's comments, and I heard him talk about Cuba, and I talked him about Venezuela. I didn't hear him say one word about El Salvador, or one word about William H. Duncan. These are not the same countries. It's not like they all look alike. <laughs> They're different countries. Now, we don't want them to be alike. That's true. We don't want them to be alike. And the danger we have, and, and I will have a request for my senator from Florida in a second, that the danger we have is if we send El Salvador a sign of disrespect by not sending them an ambassador, the dangerous tendency of the current president, Bukele, becoming more and more authoritarian could move El Salvador into a position where they're more and more like Cuba. And I don't think any of us want that to happen. And so I would render a softer version of my request to my colleague from Florida. And instead of asking unanimous consent that we just have a, a UC vote on this, I would soften it and ask unanimous consent that at a time to be determined by the majority leader, the Senate consider this nomination, calendar 1106, William H. Duncan, career member of the Senior Foreign Service, and that the Senate vote on the nomination, offering to all the opportunity to vote no, if that's their choice, without intervening action or debate, and that if confirmed, the motion to reconsider be considered made and laid upon the table with the President notified immediately of the Senate's action. Is there objection? Mr. President. Senator Florida. As soon as President Biden puts out a statement that all the peaceful protesters uh, in Cuba should be immediately released, I, would, I will not object. But until he does, I object. Objection is heard.